Thank you very much for inviting me to be here, and I certainly thank the President and uh, Kevin Cheng in particular for the uh, uh, kind words that were said. Uh, and I hope that this discussion today really will be a discussion. We have a format for exchange, and that's very much on the tradition of uh, the University of Chicago. Uh, so what I want to talk about today, I will say I'm extraordinarily impressed with Kevin's devotion to the Chicago Economic Society. I think it's a very uh, good symbol, uh, but at the high end of the intensity level for Kevin to have invested, to have organized this in Hong Kong, and to have organized the event, which was very pleasant last fall in, uh, at the IMF in, uh, in, Chico in uh, Washington, D.C. So I think uh, he, he deserves a great deal of praise. So what I want to talk about today is a problem that is really on the front of every, or not every, but one of the major social questions, and that is social mobility and inequality. And so let me, let me just begin uh, and, and, and mention what Kevin mentioned before, was that a new center was formed at the University of Chicago, the Center for the Economics of Human Development, uh, which is actually trying to integrate studies across different fields, but using economic analysis to provide that kind of integration. Uh, and that really trying to understand human development and human uh, possibility and how we might increase increase and improve uh, that, uh, that dimension. So let me just start off with some facts that I lifted from my host, one of my hosts here, Richard Wong, who has uh, studied the evolution of the Gini coefficient in Hong Kong. And this evolution, I don't want to pit particularly on Hong Kong or focus solely on it, but we can see like in many countries around the world, many regions and areas around the world, inequality has increased. And this is whether we measure individual income or whether we measure household income. So if you go, say, from 1976 to, to um, 2011, the latest year, uh, Richard's analysis shows that there is a uh, real increase in the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality uh, among households and among individuals. And another dimension along the same lines is how much the ratio of people at the top of the distribution, the 90th percentile, what their incomes would be relative to those at the bottom 10 percentile. This is a topic that's received attention everywhere. In fact, there's been a long discussion about the 99 versus the 1, and whole discussions about how we might uh, reduce inequality and what the relationship is between inequality and social opportunity. But let me, in particular, focus on a a phenomenon, uh, uh, so-called so the Great Gatsby Curve. The Great Gatsby Curve, that's a name that was given to this relationship um, that is uh, uh, patterned after a, a famous book by F. Scott Fitzgerald in the 1920s, at a time when the United States was enjoying a very high level of inequality, uh, but showing basically the lifestyles of the rich and how they differed from the lifestyles of the poor. A relationship has been established, an empirical relationship, which most recently Alan Kruger, when he was uh, head of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama, popularized. And if you look at the relationship between income in a current generation and income in, uh, uh, of the parents, so you look at children and parents, think of it that way. There are all kinds of adjustments, I'm not going to get into all the details. But if you look at this, you'll see there's something called the intergenerational elasticity. And so things are measured in logs. Economists like to use logarithms because it gives you dimension-free, units-free, uh, percentage changes. So beta is a measure of how much the child's income is related to the parent's income. And so the higher the level of beta, the more dependent children's outcomes are on what the outcome is of the parents. And so a society, at least some people's vision of a good society, is a society where beta is very low. And if you look at this graph, I don't know if you can see it so well, but uh, it's circled for you in red, you can see that the level of this intergenerational elasticity is uh, about 0.3 
uh, somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4 in uh, Hong Kong, and um, I guess closer to 0.4. And if you look at other countries, other areas, you'll see, for example, the US is higher, uh, France is a little bit lower, uh, UK uh, quite a bit higher, actually, Italy pretty high, but other countries like Norway, Denmark, Finland, uh, are really quite low. Okay, so that's, that's what the IgE is. That's, the, that's sort of the height of this curve. But another phenomenon is related, and this is a regression relationship, trying to look at the relationship between this degree of social mobility measured by beta, with higher beta, meaning lower social mobility, and a, a measure of how much income inequality there is in the society. And if you look at the average relationship, and this has been tried, uh, estimated in many different areas uh, of the world, there's generally a positive association. So suggesting more inequality leads to higher level of intergenerational immobility. And so much has been made of this relationship. And this relationship is the basis for a lot of public policy proposals. There's, a, there's another relationship. Uh, which can be taken, this, this previous one was basically before income redistribution occurs. We know that fiscal tax systems redistribute income, so there's tax and transfers. You can also see, for example, that uh, if you look at the IGE for Hong Kong, and you look also at the measure of inequality, there's probably much less redistribution of income in Hong Kong than there would be in many of the other Western welfare states. So for example, you can see that the, I, that the, I, the Gini coefficient for Hong Kong around 0 0.35, 0 0.4 after taxes and transfers is really quite high and even uh, higher than, for example, that in the United States uh, and certainly in countries uh, like uh, Sweden, France, and, and even Italy. So many people look at this relationship either before or after tax transfer and say, okay, the immediate relationship that we should think about is that we should redistribute income, reduce the Gini coefficient, and therefore promote social mobility. So the idea is you move down this regression line. And so there's a notion that somehow, because of this empirical relationship, we should imagine public policies that are very redistributive. What I want to argue is that, of course, this graph by itself, and, all, and hundreds maybe even thousands of these graphs that have been presented, are not really informative at all on that question. Gary Becker, my uh, late colleague, wrote a very famous paper some 25 years ago that actually reversed the causality that's implicit. Most people start from the so-called x-axis, right, go to the y-axis and think, ah, x is causing y. But you can argue just the other way around, that the actual degree of mobility or immobility, beta, leads, and Becker showed this, to higher level of cross-sectional inequality. So that's, that's just one intellectual precedent for what I want to argue. But I want to go and ask uh, whether we really know about two things, reducing inequality, and second, promoting social mobility. And by the way, it's not even clear, and I won't go into this today unless we get into it in the discussion, that promoting social mobility is the same as lowering beta. I mean, these are very different questions. And the, you can have betas not only for income, but for things like education. So, and, and I'll just point out that if we were to do an analysis, if you look at this graph here, and just look at this graph I put up, you can see, for example, that Denmark looks very good. Denmark is sometimes viewed as the Garden of Eden of inequality. It has low Gini coefficient, and it also has a very low beta, so there's a lot of mobility. So people say, ah, if we adopt the Danish welfare state, this would be a very good thing for Hong Kong or for the US or for many other countries to adopt. And I would just point out that if I used instead uh, education and not income, you would actually find that uh, the betas for education of parents uh, related to the education of the children would be about the same in the United States and in Denmark, okay? So a lot of this beta being low comes directly from tax and transfer policy, which is very different, of course, in Denmark than it is in the US. So uh, 
So anyway, so this, this curve is really the basis of a lot of public policy, and I want to talk about what we know about this curve. So when you think about inequality, the traditional approach to addressing inequality, and one that's built into a lot of economic analysis, is one that you think about alms to the poor, or give money to the poor, or some kind of aspect of redistribution. And we know that there's a whole literature that's emerged about what efficient ways are for redistributing income. But what I want to argue is that there may be some scope, and there certainly is scope for redistribution. But I think what it misses is that a major component of inequality and also of social mobility has to do with capabilities, hence the title of my talk, capabilities or skills which are major determinants of both inequality and of social mobility. And what I want to argue today is that I, about a strategy that's based on creating capabilities. So these capabilities are capacities or skills. I deliberately use the word capabilities because it's also used by people like Amartya Sen and others, used more broadly than I'm going to use them today, but capabilities that essentially are, I'm, I'm thinking now, in the narrower sense I'm using them, skills, the capacities to control your life, to essentially shape your own fortune, to help you create uh, and uh, but not only just wealth, but better health, and also uh, to lead a life that may be a, a happier and more fulfilling life. So these are what I would call capacities or capabilities. So let me just very briefly outline what I think are eight lessons from the recent literature. And it's a recent literature because many of you are here, you're here in the university, a uh, very distinguished university, but you're here and thinking that most of the way we create these capabilities is through the lives of school children and university children. So we think of educational centers as being the place where we create capabilities. And there's nothing I'm gonna say that says that universities, that uh, education, secondary schools, that preschools even, and certainly elementary schools are not creating capabilities. But I want you to think about this whole process of uh, skill formation somewhat more broadly. So first of all, I want you to think that there are multiple skills. Uh, I know, I think, my impression is uh, based all around East Asia, and not just in East Asia, in Europe, and really around the world, that when most people think about skill, they think about IQ, they think about cognition, how much people learn. A score on a PISA test. Uh, for example, um, uh, China, at least the Shanghai students we know have done very well. It's a matter of pride, actually, and I know that in, uh, in many East Asian countries, PISA scores or scores like on tests like PISA play a major role in assessing schools and even matter of national and regional pride. What we've understood and come to understand in the last 20 uh, years or so of research that's brought together economics with other uh, fields is that multiple skills are required. So it's not just a question of required for what? Success in life, for better health. So multiple skills are required the multiple skills would include not just cognition, but social and emotional skills, the ability to regulate, self-control, the ability to motivate yourself. Uh, my colleague and uh, collaborator, Angela Duckworth, has used the recoined, I guess, this term grit, to really suggest that people who stay on task are really extremely successful. And so we know, we all know this, it's nothing I'm telling you that's not new, but educational policy and a lot of Social policy ignores the importance of these multiple skills. And I want to talk and show you what some of those skills are. Secondly, what we've also come to learn is that these skills, there are important gaps in who has these skills. Gaps measured by family background, by parental education, by various measures of socioeconomic status. So gaps and skills are there, and those gaps and skills are real and they create a real issue and contribute largely to the empirically important inequality. You know, the whole discussion of inequality, recently anyway, in the United States, and I think in many countries in the world, has been a notion of saying, well, these very rich people are gaining and they're somehow, so it's a sense of a little bit of envy, but what people don't seem to recognize is that in the 
middle and who are and, and the skills and the, and the income inequality that characterizes the concerns of most people who are working in most modern societies are things related to their skills, their cognition, their socio-emotional skills, and even their health. And these gaps are real and they're an important part of the whole question about inequality and important even in shaping the graph that I put up. But the one thing we've learned, and I think it's very important in terms of public policy, is that these capabilities, these skills can be created by investment. And I want to come up with a broader notion of what I mean by investment. We think of investment like an ordinary company making a building. And that's true, that's part of the story, but there's a richer notion of how these skills are actually created. But the important point is that these skills are actually created. Many people think of things like IQ, things like cognition measured by a test, not necessarily an achievement test, but certainly things like personality and health are more or less genetically determined or determined relatively early in life. And what we've come to understand is that these are things that change, that we can create them, and we have some idea about what effective strategies are that might promote these. And so that's a target of opportunity. And it's a target for promoting opportunity and really empowering people and doing it not in a negative way of saying, let's take money or resources away, but essentially endowing individuals with the capacities to act and to shape, at least in part, their own lives. But what we've also come to understand is when we shape, when we start with the structure of these skills, and we understand how these skills are created, that we've come to understand that there are critical and sensitive periods in the technology of skill formation. And this, I think, is something that we didn't really fully appreciate 15, 20 years ago, and work in epidemiology, work in genetics, work in neuroscience, and then, of course, work in economics, education, sociology, have actually emphasized that these critical and sensitive periods play a major role in shaping uh, our, and even thinking about what kind of policies are effective and when interventions and skills can be uh, formed most effectively. But we've also come to understand, and this is really important, and this is not going to surprise an audience in China, but it's a, nonetheless an important finding which really has to be understood if we think about investment more broadly is the important role of the family. The family is, extraordinary, is the creator of all opportunity, and the families, when impaired, when families are compromised, that these compromise the skills, capacities of the children. And the family is far more important than the school in actually shaping these abilities. And it's not just through genetics. Genetics plays a role. But the way that families encourage, promote, uh, or don't encourage children play huge roles. And this is important because family structure all around Asia and all around the world, actually, are under challenge in ways sometimes that are not very skilled promoting and, in fact, contribute to inequality. So what we've come to understand, too, though, is that early life or any particular period in life, even though we know that there's some notion of critical and sensitive periods where investments can be made or more, are more effective, that there still is the case that there is some resilience and that there are flexibilities, but in different dimensions of these skills. Cognitive skills tend to be set pretty well by the time children are 10, 11, 12 years of age. Social and emotional skills, much less so. And there's a lot of, lot of flexibility. And neuro work in neuroscience actually shows this. The so-called prefrontal cortex, which controls the uh, emotions and controls aspect of regulation and decision making, that's developing, we know, until the early 20s, and in fact is the target for real opportunity. Uh, but what we've also come to understand, much more than we did before, is that the style of parenting, the style of investment, is not just a pedagogical one. Here I am lecturing you, I'm, you know, this is a pedagogical style. But it's also this notion of interaction, it's the exchange, the interaction. So whether we're talking about uh, looking at a child early on with a parent, or whether we're talking about an adolescent learning about a skill on the job, so an apprenticeship, that these mentor-child, parent-child interactions play a key role in what we know constitutes a successful learning strategy. 
So, you know, this typical image is of a lecture somewhat like this, where somebody is standing in front of a large room writing on the board or handing down the truths, you know, whether it's from um, Milton Friedman or from Confucius or any other authority, and doing this in a one-way flow. But what we've really come to understand is that the structure is much more one of give and take. And this has implications for the way we devise uh, strategies for learning. But what we've also come to understand as we've understood the uh, mechanisms and the technology of how skills are formed, that the early years are playing a very important role, much more than we used to think was true, I think, even 20 years ago. I think at an intuitive level, we understood this was very important. But we've come through both econometric analyses, a lot of studies, that early investment plays a powerful role, and it has to do with the dynamics of how all of these capabilities are formed. A good skill base early on creates productivity over the whole lifetime, and that, I think, is something we didn't fully appreciate. So that education, true education, true learning, true capacity formation really starts even before the child is born. It starts in the womb. Not just through the genetics, but the way through environments are, are, are preserved. Starvation, through famine, uh, that is a very serious negative stress. We also know that there is a substantial evidence that the early years, children stimulating their children, uh, parents stimulating their children, and environments encouraging learning play a very positive role. And when we quantify those returns, they're very high, very substantial. And so even most educational systems are starting at around age five or six. But what we've come to understand is those preschool years, especially for disadvantaged children without rich home environments, can be very, very important and represent targets of opportunity. So what is the key idea? The key idea that comes out of this literature is a, is a concept that I've called dynamic complementarity. What is complementarity? It's synergism. It's the, it's the statement that individuals who are bright and motivated are probably the individuals who are most capable of learning. So bright people learn more, motivated people learn more. We know that. And they generally achieve more. What we've also come to learn is that the complementarity, how much early skill, how much the skill base affects your capacity to learn, that complementarity actually increases with age. So actually having a good advantage and a good skill base is more important at 17 than it is at 7. Now why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because it suggests that what you might do, oops, let me go back a second, if you think about this for a second, you can build a skill base. And by building the skill base early, you can exploit the fact that this complementarity, this synergism, this, 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 this cross, these positive cross effects becoming much stronger at later ages. And that that is a notion that justifies why early investments that set the skill base can be so productive. So what I want to argue is that even in the politics of redistribution, the 99 versus the 1, the notion about how we might promote skills and redistribution, uh, we might also think about what I call pre-distribution. Pre-distribution in the sense of setting the skill base. By creating the skills, by forming the skills, we can create a tremendous uh, uh, opportunity and in fact address the question and reinterpret that great Gatsby curve and reinterpret, I think in a more positive and constructive way, what effective policies might be for reducing inequality and promoting social mobility. So I think what we need in, in current policy discussions and current political discussions is a, a comprehensive understanding of capability formation. So let me just talk very, very uh, quickly. I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm running out of time. I think, what, 30 minutes or uh, how much time, 30 minutes? Uh, how much time do I have left, even? I, I have uh, lost track. I got carried away. Kevin gave you a warning this could happen. So we locked the doors and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but how much time? 15 minutes. Okay, but I would just want to sketch a few facts. I mean, one, I am an empirical economist, and uh, I think some of the strength of what I'm saying, uh, and I'm not alone, obviously, in saying this. There are a lot of very intuitive ideas here. But some of the strength in the modern understanding of investment has to come that we've quantified 
and we've really put together pieces. And I think uh, that quantification is quite interesting. So let me just give you the rudiments of what this quantification shows you. But one key notion that I think is missing in most of the public policy discussion is the notion that when we solve a problem, we should address the problem that manifests itself. I don't know what the saying is in Chinese, but in English we say, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? So if you have a problem, solve the problem. And that's a very effective way. If you have a problem, obviously we could prevent all kinds of possible problems. You know, we could build, we could make hundreds of billions of dollars protecting against a Martian invasion, you know, and if it isn't there, then we'd be wasting our resources. So there is some wisdom in, in waiting until a problem shows itself. But I think it's also the case that we've come sufficiently far down the road of understanding how skills are formed to understand that solutions uh, that would attack only a problem once it manifests itself, usually in the later years or some, at some time long after a problem is really formed, that these are sometimes often very ineffective. And so what's suggested is that a fragmented approach can be often very ineffective. So let me give you an example of a fragmented solution. All of these sound correct, right? Nothing here is wrong. So if you have crime, uh, you have more police. We know police prevent crime. No big finding there. If you want to promote skills, you build more schools, hire teachers, and raise test scores. Again, nothing strange there. If you want to promote health, you have more doctors. Uh, if you want to reduce obesity, you have promotional campaigns to promote obesity. If you want to reduce teenage pregnancy, you know, have pregnancy re prevention programs and so forth. And in fact, and this is a little less obvious, but one that's still very popular around the world, if you want to reduce inequality, give people money. I mean, there's no better way to reduce inequality by giving people money. Uh, and so, and promote housing programs for the poor. These are very common strategies. Uh, but, and I'm not saying any of them are wrong. You can give people money. And you can reduce the inequality. But what I'm hoping to try to communicate is that there's a broader strategy, this strategy of pre-distribution, that essentially exploits recent knowledge about the synergisms of skills and the dynamics of how skills are formed. So I want to talk, just in the time remaining, sketch a unified approach to thinking about public policy, how we might address these problems using a strategy of human mobility. So it's a strategy of preventing problems rather than just remediation. I mean, there's a deep issue. There are some problems that are much better treated after they're manifest. We know that. Uh, but we also know, even like brushing your teeth or, or uh, any other commonplace examples, that sometimes if we take care of ourselves and invest early and prevent early, say, take, take measures to to walk and, and take healthy lifestyle that we know that we can actually gain. By, uh, and so prevention can frequently be a very effective strategy. But I don't want to just cast it in terms of prevention. I want to talk about an opportunity of investment that actually is boosting the capabilities. So it's really a statement of human agency, how human beings can be more effective in controlling their own lives and shaping their own fate. And I think that's a very important notion. So it's not just a matter of trying to avoid ill, which although it is that, but it's also a sense of trying to make people the best they can be and exploit opportunities in society at large. So what are the ingredients of an effective capability formation? Family. Family is powerfully important. This notion I already talked about multiple capabilities. And what we've come to understand is the synergism among these capabilities. So the family is playing an important role that frequently gets neglected. Now, the Chinese family, compared to a lot of the other families around the world, family systems, we know that in Hong Kong there are more uh, out-of-wedlock births. We know there are more single parents than there were traditionally in the past. But by world standards, China and certainly Hong Kong uh, and many East Asian countries are far below what has become a norm. In the U.S., we have 40 percent of all children born out of wedlock. And that by itself is not just a moral statement. In the United States, it's actually a statement about fewer resources being given to the children with documented consequences to the lives of the children. So we've come to understand that for disadvantaged families, 
Supplementing the family, enriching the life of child, can actually promote and has a very effective, positive role. Um, and they, when we look at what is uh, the economic return to these investments, and this has been studied now through a series of studies with long, randomly assigned individuals who get enriched and disadvantaged individuals, uh, given enriched family environments, that those environments have had outcomes which lead to more jobs, uh, lead to higher levels of education, leads to lower crime, less teenage pregnancy. All of that list of problems, which is frequently treated one at a time, we get multiple benefits. And the multiple benefits come because these multiple capabilities are shaping. They're shaping the element of self-control, the ability to earn in the labor market. They're shaping the, the, what, what economists would think of as the, the uh, production possibilities, the, the possibilities, really, of who, what you can be and what you can become. So I think the universal ingredient in all of these interventions, whether it's in schools, in families, in mentors, is what I would call scaffolding and what child development experts would call scaffolding. And this really comes to a very different notion. And this is not a didactic model of the usual sense. It's a model of staying with a child, interacting with a child, finding when a child, and a child here can be an adolescent, uh, quite, quite uh, a, a, even young adult, but basically taking the child to the next step, interacting and interplay. That's the essence of what involves successful learning. And so that involves then that the child and for that matter, the parent are emerging in a system uh, of which the skills are defined and the, and the technology of uh, interaction is being created. So it's the, it's the dynamics of skill formation that early skills are building the base that make later skill investments so productive that leads to a rethinking of public policy. You know, 50 years ago, Lyndon Johnson, or 51 years ago, I guess now, launched what was called the War on Poverty looking again at inequality. And so what, any, what Johnson thought, remember this was 1964 when this was launched. Johnson's purposes were highly commendable. He meant well, and he was deeply concerned about poverty in America. But what he thought and didn't know, and what his advisors didn't know, or what most social scientists didn't know, was the dynamics of skill formation. So Johnson thought, okay, look, we're gonna make everybody better off. So I'm gonna get young children, he started Head Start, I'm going to get old adults, like 50, 60-year-old retired or unemployed steel, steel, steel workers or, or people in the middle ages of, say, 30, 40. I'm going to invest in all of these people. And there was a notion that everybody's skill could be boosted uniformly and successfully. And the notion that IQ could be boosted was pretty revolutionary. And off the map was any notion that promoting social and emotional skills had anything to do with health had anything to do with lifetime success. But we've come to understand through the dynamics of skill formation that these skills are highly interrelated and uh, that in fact a life cycle strategy can be highly effective. So this graph here, maybe I should stop with this graph. I could go on, but I, <laughs> I, I don't want to, I think we want to have an exchange here. Is I think what we've come to understand, and I have a lot of other data that I can show, but I don't want to beat you to death with a lot of facts. But it's this, this tripartite arrangement. So instead of thinking about these questions as saying, we want to have better health, well, how do you have better health? You have better hospitals, better doctors, for sure, better screening, vaccinations. But what we've come to understand is that an important ingredient of better health is education, self-control. So if you look, for example, we, we ran an experiment, we being a, a collective, a group of us with, that, with which I'm associated, ran. Uh, experiment where we took disadvantaged children uh, that were basically living in really severe circumstances, at least in American context, severe circumstances. And we took those children, gave them in the early years, this is starting now at only seven weeks of age and following them up to age five, we gave them social, emotional stimulation, interacted with them, and then we randomly assigning a group to treatment, another group to control, we follow their success in life until the mid-30s. They're 35 to 40 years of age right now. And what we found was that these programs boosted social and emotional skills, 
It's certainly self-control, measures of regulation, measured very different way. Health, at age 35, we found that the treatment group in these, these basically uh, social, emotional, cognitive interaction groups were basically uh, more healthy. They were, had lower obesity. They had much higher level of, uh, much lower level of uh, risk factors for heart disease and for diabetes. And um, we also had saw a real example of even boosting IQ if we started at seven weeks of age. But what we also saw was this cross-fertilization. And that's the part that's missed. So you can see that what this is doing is saying we build a skill base, this has multiple manifestations across multiple dimensions of life. And so that's the sense in which we stay out of the silo and we stay and we think to ourselves, well, instead of thinking just one fragment at a time, boosting health, boosting this, boost, we want to think, we want to supplement existing strategies. And I think that's, that's the point that really hasn't been fully appreciated and in, in full honesty, is still being appreciated as we are developing this. See, this is an ongoing area. I don't want to lecture here and say this is a settled area, everything is fully known. What's exciting about this area, where economists are coming together with neuroscientists, epidemiologists, child development psychologists, ordinary personality psychologists and cognitive psychologists, and sociologists and other groups, is that we've really come to understand how we integrate the biology, the neuroscience, the economics, and the social science together. And in this sense, we can develop a more effective strategies and think about what are good strategies for promoting poverty. So um, I think maybe I should stop, since I've been down to five minutes. I could go on and talk about each of these points in greater detail, but maybe it's better to promote that instead of uh, so dealing with some generalities, I promise you there are another 20 or 30 slides, and I could give you some ex specific examples on each one of these uh, points. But but I, I would just uh, conclude this uh, talk with this diagram and suggest that uh, as we have come to understand this technology, you know, for example, in, in certain aspects of health, we know we can wait until somewhat later ages. Uh, there's a lot of medical evidence that if you quit smoking 20 years later, you can probably reduce the risk, except for a small residual risk of lung cancer. So if you're smoking cigarettes, after a while, you know, you can reduce your risk. On the other hand, we do know for blindness, for example, if a child is born into an adverse environment, and we know that in Western China there are such adverse environments uh, in very poor areas, vitamin A deficient, or, for example, iodine deficient, you can have lasting defects. For example, serious vitamin A deficiency can lead to permanent blindness. And there's no remediation known to this point, to this day. So what we've come to understand is that if we look at these various skills, there are critical, there are sensitive periods, and we can think about an educational policy that's richer, that involves more interaction, that's targeted better, and that understands that the family life especially the family life of disadvantaged children, plays a very, very important role. And that by supplementing the family life, we can actually make real benefits uh, for the children. So let me just, let me just conclude with one, one thing about an intervention we're going to talk more about, I guess, later today, but I will talk about it. An intervention that I'm engaged in uh, with a group of people here in, uh, in China, I should say, in Gansu province. This is an area where a lot of inventories have shown children suffering from anemia, from vitamin A deficiency, uh, from many uh, uh, iron deficiency, uh, we know leads to lower IQ if you're not supplementing. So what we've done in collaboration with uh, epidemiologists and uh, early childhood experts around the world, we've actually uh, developed a, a strategy which has precedence in early childhood in uh, Jamaica. And this uh, intervention uh, has the following property. It is basically intervening with nutritional supplements for children in very disadvantaged areas with nutritional issues, micro and macronutrients. Low calories are being alleviated, and micronutrients like iron, zinc, uh, vitamin A, and some of these supplements are being given. But based on earlier work that we've seen, the most successful form of those interventions 
are tailored towards promoting social and emotional skills and cognitive skills of children. But what is the successful vehicle? And we, we can talk more about this if there's an interest. But the successful vehicle is not bringing the children in and giving lectures to these children. It's actually working with the parents. It's actually changing the dynamics of the family structure. It's basically changing that interaction between parent and child. The parent is with the child many hours of the day. And it's that changing the nature of that relationship, which we know isn't always healthy or always the best informed, which gives an effective strategy for promoting these skills. And so even in Gansu, which is really seriously nutritionally challenged, there are some deficiencies, and apparently from baseline surveys, lack of knowledge about basic parenting practices. And the hope is that we can, and we are actively engaged in uh, conducting, designing, uh, and raising funds for, or trying to raise funds for, the strategy of, of understanding this problem using randomized controlled trials and understanding what would be effective strategies. So I think this is an example in China, in a disadvantaged area of China, of where we're trying to apply this knowledge. But this is now being applied everywhere. Uh, we, I heard uh, earlier today uh, about uh, strategies that are being developed for many countries around the world. And, uh, we know there are many, many serious scholars, some in this room, actually, working on this. So here, I just conclude by saying this is an exciting area of research. It's academically interesting. So if your goal is only to publish papers, whether it's in neuroscience or whether it's in epidemiology or in economics, this is a fertile area. But it also is fertile because it changes public policy. And it would even change the way we think about inequality and social mobility. So instead of it's just a policy of saying, give money to the poor, which is the ancient strategy. I mean, I think 2,000, 3,000 years ago, we didn't really understand how these skills were formed. Now we do. There's another strategy that I would argue is equally powerful, maybe more powerful, instead of just giving money. Actually giving people the skills to function on their own, to choose their own life, become less dependent, and become autonomous individuals. So thank you very much.